This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Good morning. First, let me say how excited I am to be participating in this great endeavor to bring research scientists out into the public forum to share their knowledge and excitement about investigating and understanding our Earth. As an educator, I believe events like this are crucial, are a crucial component of the UCR program. Having worked and played in the forest for much of my life, it is a privilege to introduce to you this morning someone who has made it their work to understand how tropical forests interact with the atmosphere to provide us with many benefits we human take for granted, such as absorbing carbon and providing us with oxygen. Dr. Luis Santiago is Assistant Professor of Physiological Ecology and Assistant Physiological Ecologist in the Department of Botany and Plant Sciences here at UCR. He approaches the subject of carbon from the perspective of years of research on how much carbon tropical trees take up and how their carbon footprint differs among different tree species and among different forest types. Today he extends his knowledge to discuss our role in the global carbon cycle. He received his Bachelor of Arts in Integrative Biology from UC Berkeley. After developing an interest in plant science, he returned home to Hawaii where he earned a Master of Science in Botany from the University of Hawaii and a PhD in botany from the University of Florida. Distinctions include the Environmental Protection Agency Star Fellowship in 2000, National Science Foundation Minority Postdoctoral Fellowship in 2003, and, an, and International Research Fellowship in 2004, and the Ikika de la Garza Fellowship in 2011 from the USDA. Professor Santiago, with his wife, who is also a biologist, has researched environmental physiology of plants with emphasis on understanding how photosynthesis is regulated by plant hydraulic processes. He also has an active interest in determining the role of plant water use in the hydraulic cycles of forested watersheds. Professor Santiago also works at identifying a rich spectrum of research opportunities in plant sciences for students attending UCR, providing them with the chance to participate in high-level research on the cutting edge of natural and agricultural resource science. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Luis Santiago. Thanks, John. And before I get started, I just want to emphasize that although I'm presenting this talk, this is very much a joint effort. Uh, Mr. Robinson and I met several times to talk about what goes into this talk and to try to make this a really understandable presentation for you. So I hope you enjoy it. So what is your carbon footprint? This is an interesting question, and to me, it really begs the question of why carbon? Okay, why, why are we so interested in our carbon footprint? And what is it about carbon, especially when it forms a molecule with these two atoms of oxygen to form CO2? Why is this so interesting to us? Well, one reason it's interesting is if we look at our atmosphere, we can see that the concentration of CO2 in our atmosphere is increasing, okay? Um, this is usually measured at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, um, where they've been measuring kind of constant increase in CO2 in the atmosphere for a number of years now. And this is a very strong pattern. Um, you know, every year they, they put out their current CO2 concentration for the year, and so I just looked this up in February. It was 393.65 ppm this year. And just to give you an idea, so I, I work a lot with photosynthesis. When I was a graduate student um, a long time ago, not that long ago, in the 90s perhaps, um, we would set our instruments to about 360, okay? And so this wasn't that long ago. Um, this was our ambient CO2. We'd, we'd set our instruments at that, take measurements. And now, and just a few years later, it's 393. So just in, in my relatively short career as a scientist, the change in CO2 concentration of the atmosphere um, is already palpable. Okay, um, how long has this been going on? So if we look at CO2 in our atmosphere, 
since about the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, um, CO2 has been going up in the atmosphere. It started um, around the late 1800s with um, coal burning to, to fire early factories. Okay, and um, this began the process of taking carbon that was previously stored deep in the earth and burning it and transforming it into a gas and putting it into our atmosphere. And so it's a really you know, direct relationship between you know, how much oil or how much coal we burn to what ends up in the atmosphere. Okay? It's, a, it's a direct process that, that we can measure pretty accurately. And so this is what, what we would see for carbon concentration over the past um, you know, 100 years, a little more. If we look farther back in history, you know, farther back about 400,000 years, um, what we see is that the CO2 concentration of the Earth has fluctuated. Okay? It's gone up and down, but really in, in recent history, um, it hasn't gone above 300 ppm, and we're approaching 400 ppm now. So it's really, really clear that anthropogenic activities, the, the activities of humans, the, the things that we do, um, is actually affecting our atmosphere. And this is why people are asking these questions about what is our carbon footprint or what is our role in the carbon cycle. Okay, now why carbon? Well, what about other molecules out in the atmosphere that trap heat um, or affect the way our climate works? Um, the interesting thing is if you, look at, if you look at what is in the atmosphere and what can actually trap heat, most of w what's making the difference is CO2. Okay, CO2 has a big heat trapping capacity, and even though there are some other molecules like methane that actually um, can, can also trap a lot of heat, there's so much more CO2 that that's really what's having the big effect. And this is why people are talking about carbon. Okay, um, and if we look at that CO2 in the atmosphere, what we find is that the majority of that CO2 um, that, that's been part of this change in CO2 in recent history, the majority of that is, is coming directly from fossil fuel combustion. Okay, scientists have ways of measuring carbon in the atmosphere and determining using carbon isotopes and getting an idea of where it came from, okay? And so what they've been able to show is that most of, of what's trapping the heat um, is CO2, and most of that is coming directly from burning of fossil fuels. So again, humans are doing this, and we wanna know what our role in this is, and that's why we ask this question. I, I emphasize the burning of fossil fuels because it's really the main process that's driving this phenomenon. Um, we're, we're taking carbon that was previously stored underground, burning it, and transporting it to the atmosphere and causing a change. Okay, so when, when we ask what our carbon footprint is, we're really asking here, what, what is our role in this global carbon cycle? How are we shaping the way carbon moves around on our globe? And if we look at a carbon cycle, you can see that carbon is stored in, in a few different places. It's stored in vegetation, it's stored in the ocean, it's stored in atmosphere, um, it's stored in soils. And the, the really big change um, is, is our burning of fossil fuels and our alteration of, of the carbon cycle by moving a previously sequestered source into um, a mobile source in, into the atmosphere. And so that's kind of been our big impact, and that's been kind of the human role in the carbon cycle most recently. Okay, so what is your carbon footprint? This is the question of the talk, so we need to get to this. Um, well, like many questions, there's a short answer and a long answer, okay? So people often wanna hear what the short answer is. What's the simple answer? Well, the simple answer is 19.78, tons of CO2 per person per year, okay? And this is very easy to look up. You can look up for different countries, um, how much carbon they produce to the atmosphere, the carbon footprints of entire countries. You can divide that by the number of people living in a country, so divided by all of us. Um, each of our share, mathematically, is 19.78, okay? Um, so, so there's our number, okay? We can look at the world. This is a, a, a map of the world showing different colors um, of countries that reflect how much carbon they use. What is their carbon impact? And you can see there's a lot of variation. Um, some industrialized countries with large populations like the US and China have the largest um, carbon footprint on the planet. There are a number of non-industrialized countries um, shown in green that tend to not have a big carbon impact. Okay, so it really varies across the globe. But again, a lot of this is really well documented and can be looked up just online so you know what is our carbon footprint we, we can just look it up actually okay the, we can 
can look at this in a different ways. If you compare countries, one of the interesting things that you find is the per capita carbon footprint of countries is really highest in some of these small countries, okay? Um, some of these city states, places like Kuwait, um, Qatar, they're, they're very small countries um, that are very rich countries, and so everyone living there has a really high standard of living, okay? They don't, they don't have a lot of poor people, they don't um, have people farming or anything like that that live in lower um, carbon conditions, and so they tend to be really high, but these, these are actually very small countries. And so what, what people often do is they say, okay, let, let's just look at the most industrialized countries, the countries that have the biggest carbon footprint and at the same time have a you know, reasonable population. And so when we look at that, um, per capita, the US is the biggest user of carbon. Okay. Um, other countries um, like Australia and in other industrialized countries also have a big impact. China has the biggest um, carbon impact of any country, um, but they have a lot of people. So when we divide it um, by their population, their, their per capita impact tends to get very small. Um, but as a country, they, they produce the most. And these things are changing somewhat year to year. Um, a lot of the European countries have actually reduced their carbon impacts. Um, countries like the Netherlands and Norway have actually um, put in some really strong um, policies in place um, so that as a country, they've kind of come together to reduce their, their carbon imp impact on the world. Okay. Um, but what about the rest of the world? I mean, people often focus on industrialized countries and as this discussion was emerging back in the 90s, this became very interesting to us. I was at the University of Florida. I was very interested in tropical biology. And so we started talking about what are, what are, what's happening in some of these less developed countries, okay, where they're not burning a lot of fossil fuels. What's going on there? Well, one of the things we see is deforestation. Uh, it's not as big of an impact as fossil fuels, but deforestation actually um, does have a, a carbon impact. As you can imagine, if you take um, a, a patch of forest and you cut it down and burn it, um, that CO2 is going into the atmosphere. It's contributing to our increasing CO2, okay? Um, however, as this forest grows back, it's also going to grow and it's going to sequester some of that carbon. You know, if you look at a plant, most of what you see is carbon. And so as they grow and get bigger, they're, they're pulling in carbon from the atmosphere. So, so forests do this. And if we look in the tropics, many, um, many indigenous tropical people, they um, practice slash and burn agriculture. They, they cut their forest, they grow there for a few years until the soil starts to decrease their yield, and then they'll move to an Another area and cut and they'll let that area grow back. But as population increases, more areas are being cut. So if you look at a number of developing countries, we're seeing more deforestation and more carbon impacts, not quite matching what's going on with fossil fuels, but um, it, it is having an impact. So we wanted to learn about this um, back in the 90s, we were interested in what was going on, um, especially in Latin America, and the idea that, you know, in the northern hemisphere, we've already cut a lot of our forests, but we're going to need to protect that Amazon for, for the globe. Um, we can't cut those forests. On the other hand, Brazil is growing as a country. They're industrializing. They're saying, hey, we should be able to cut our forests to promote our economy because that's what all these other countries did at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, you know. And so this has um, become something interesting that we need to figure out what's going on in the tropics. So in order to study this, I went off to Barrow, Colorado Island in Panama. Here the Smithsonian has a research institute and I was lucky enough to be able to work here um, looking at plants and how they interact with the atmosphere. And so you could actually say what we were doing is we were studying the carbon footprint of leaves because leaves interact with the atmosphere, they cycle carbon with the atmosphere, and we wanted to know what they were doing because there are these vast amounts of tropical forest that actually cycle a lot of the carbon and water um, of the planet. And we really needed to know what they were doing and what their role was. And so one of the big things that we know about plants is that they absorb CO2 from the atmosphere through the process of photosynthesis. Okay, so while we're putting CO2 up in the atmosphere, plants are actually taking it in um, through photosynthesis and they're, they're reducing that a little bit. And plants also put out water. As they open their stomates to take in CO2, well, water starts to evaporate out. So it's kind of a, a necessary trade-off here. They lose some water, they get some carbon. This is how plants operate. And so for the first time, we were actually to get able to get up into the canopies of tropical forests to measure the leaves that are exposed to the sun. These are the leaves that photosynthesize the most. They're the leaves that exchange most of the matter and energy with the atmosphere. And so we were able to measure these thanks to this ingenious approach um, developed by my advisor. Um, my PhD advisor, which is 
building a canopy crane in the middle of a tropical forest and hanging off of it in a little basket um, with a walkie-talkie where you tell the crane operator in Spanish where you want to go around the canopy and they take you there and you take your measurements. So that's a picture of me measuring photosynthesis in the tropical forest canopy. And so we measured a bunch of species and we wanted to know about their carbon footprint. We wanted to know are they all doing the same thing? Are they doing different things? How can we model this? And the interesting thing that we found is that all these species are doing different things in terms of their carbon. Okay, some are photosynthesizing a lot, some are photosynthesizing a little, some are turning their leaves over at different rates. There's a tremendous of variety with every species in terms of how it manages its carbon budget. Okay, and to, to return to our question, what is your carbon footprint? We notice it's the same thing with people. If we look at people and we look at the decisions that they make, how they interact with their environment, the, the individual personal decisions that people make, it varies greatly from person to person. Everyone's doing different things. And so this is why our, our calculation of 19.78 tons of carbon per person per year really is not satisfying, because we're not all doing the same thing, okay? And so in order to answer this question, I said there's a short answer and a long answer, okay? The long answer is that it really depends, okay? It really depends on how you live your life. And so, you know, all the decisions that you make um, have a, an impact on carbon. And how would you ever figure out how all those little decisions that you make in your life add up to your carbon footprint? Okay, that's a challenging question, right? Well, fortunately, I brought my handy carbon footprint calculator. Okay, and so this is a really cool device that you find online, and it allows you to kind of go through and, and input information about your activities, about your own resource use, and that you can actually calculate your own carbon footprint. And so I'm gonna talk a, lot about, a little bit about what goes into this, because I think it's a really great illustration of what your carbon footprint is composed of. In other words, what are the things that you do that determine your carbon footprint? Or in other words, how do you interact with the atmosphere? Okay, so if we look at one of these things, I just wanted to show what, what it looks like online, because it it's exactly this. It's a carbon footprint calculator, and you punch in all your, you know, your numbers for things and try to figure out how much you're using. The first thing they want to know is how you heat your house, obviously. This is a pretty big um, energy expenditure, especially in really cold areas, um, and also sometimes in warm areas because of air conditioning. So they want to know about climate control of your house is the first thing. And so um, you can put in some information, you know, electricity that you use, natural gas. Some people heat their house by burning wooden pellets. You know, there's a whole variety of ways people heat their house. Depending how you heat your house actually determines part of your carbon budget. And, and it determines a big part, actually. Um, and so what else goes into this? What else can we learn by what they ask us for? So one, once we've sorted out how we heat our house, the next big thing is flying. And I have to say, this kills my carbon footprint, you know. Flying on a couple long flights per year can, can erase like a year of biking to work. I mean, it, it really has a big impact. And I, you know, as an academic, I fly to visit colleagues, I fly to conferences sometimes. And so, you know, as, as professionals in our field, we have some mechanisms by which we don't have to fly everywhere to meet people. Sometimes we have conferences on Skype, we email back and forth or talk on the phone, all those kinds of things. Um, but sometimes, we, sometimes there's no substitute for a face-to-face -face meeting. So um, when I have to fly, there's a big carbon impact happening. Okay. The funny thing is it's not only just flying. Um, it depends how you fly. If you fly first class, it's going to be a bigger carbon imp imp impact, right? Um, you know, your imported wine and your imported cheeses in first class, that's all great, but it takes a little more carbon to get them there, okay? So even, even with something as simple as flying, how you fly, what airlines you fly, what class you fly, can also determine how much carbon is, is being expended for your activities. Okay. Um, automobiles are an obvious one. There's a tremendous amount of information that they ask for about automobiles. Um, you know, do you have an old car, a new car? What's the gas mileage? How much do you drive? How many miles per month, per day? Um, you know, do you have a hybrid or do you have a 1972 Suburban that gets, you know, three gallons per mile? Okay. Um, you know, or are you somewhere in between? So um, you can factor this in, actually. And, um, you know, it's really revealing. Cars are one of the most important things in your carbon footprint. Um, trains, any type of travel, actually. You know, trains expend a tremendous amount of energy, whether you're traveling on trains or buses. Public transportation obviously reduces your carbon footprint because that bus or train is going anyway, whether or not you're on it, okay? And the more people that are on it and not using some alternative mode of transportation, that would obviously lower your carbon footprint. 
Okay. Um, biking and motorcycling also are other ways to get around. Um, biking obviously reduces your carbon footprint tremendously. Motorcycles are pretty efficient though. Okay. Um, yeah, wear a helmet, they're a little bit dangerous, but you know, they do lower your, your carbon footprint. Um, obviously walking um, is, is the lowest carbon footprint. Um, and so as a mode of transportation, um, if, you, if you walked instead of rode a motorcycle or drove a car, you'd actually lower your carbon footprint tremendously. Okay. Food choices are a big one. And I, I really want to emphasize this. I'm in a botany department, okay? And so we're agriculturally oriented. We talk a lot about food and food choices. And, you know, the, the most obvious thing here is that if you eat whole foods um, that have been grown, that come out of the ground, something like a potato, um, that is the best you can do because any other processed foods, any food that goes through a factory, gets put in a box, you know, there's a there's a amount of energy that gets expended in that factory to make that industrialized food, and so what what we've come come we've come to the conclusion that for your carbon footprint um, and for your health, there's nothing like eating whole foods. You know that that juice that says it has you know the equivalent of 15 carrots in it. You know, it's better to eat a carrot. It really is. So food choices are a big one, and um, it's important because you know food, food is healthy, food makes you feel good, and I feel better after eating whole foods than I do industrialized foods um, because I don't, I don't so much like the idea of my food in a, in a factory, um, but the carbon impact is another aspect of this. Um, food doesn't need to go through a factory. Okay, um, organic produce is another one, okay? Um, no pesticides, there's no, there's no big factory with a smokestack making fertilizer to put on the organic food. There, there's no big factory with a smokestack making pesticides to spray on your organic food. Okay, so you can already see there's a lot less of a carbon impact going into organic food. The thing about, uh, about organic food though is that it's expensive. It's more expensive, and in many cases, it's well worth it. Um, if you don't want to eat a high pesticide load on your strawberries, buy organic strawberries. But the thing about organic food, though, is not all, or not all food carries a pesticide load. So, for example, I would never buy an organic avocado, because the way avocados are grown, um, they're nearly essentially organic anyway. And so you wouldn't really have a big benefit about, for buying an organic avocado. On the other hand, if it were a blueberry, Normal blueberries are loaded with pesticides. So, you know, if I had a little bit of money I was gonna spend on organic food, it, it would be on blueberries and not avocados, for example. So a little bit of information to figure out what kind of foods you might wanna buy organic that'd be really good, and then other foods that would be essentially the same if they're organic or not. A little bit of information can help you kind of make decisions and focus on where you'd wanna improve your carbon budget um, and, your, and your financial budgets um, in terms of how much organic food you eat. Okay, um, another thing that's come, come along is people always say, eat locally, okay? If, if you're eating some food that was you know, grown um, in the Central Valley and brought here, well, there's not as much of a transportation cost as if you're eating something that was grown in Chile and brought here, right? So um, just brought from up the road, not a huge fossil fuel cost to um, drive that food thousands and thousands of kilometers to get here, okay? And so, in general, this is true. If you eat locally, you will always have a lower carbon footprint. But it's interesting, there, there are two foods, actually, that are so energy intensive to produce that it, it really doesn't matter if you eat them locally or, or from very far away, um, because most of the energy is to produce those foods. And those are red meat and dairy products. And it, it's really remarkable. Um, so some of the calculations that people have talked about are, for example, um, if people, like if I were to reduce the red meat in my diet by 20%, that would basically have the same effect on my carbon footprint as eating all my food locally, okay? Huge impact, just by reducing the amount of red meat a little bit. Um, likewise with dairy products, you know, many, many vegetarians don't eat dairy products at all. Um, also, a number of Asian groups don't really eat dairy products at all. It's not really part of their diet. Um, for a normal, regular American like me, if I were to just cut dairy out, out of my diet completely, it would also have the same impact as, you know, um, eating everything locally. Okay, and so, so red meat and dairy impacts, have, they have a big impact on the carbon cycle, 
um, more than most other foods. Okay, they, they will, eating them will increase your carbon footprint. And the, the message here is, you know, I'm not saying, you know, never eat red meat or dairy products again, but the idea here is really just to have the information to make informed decisions, okay? Maybe, maybe when you go get your special imported cheese from France, you're really gonna enjoy it, and that's a special thing, and you know that it's a special thing, okay? And so just understanding, you know, the, the impacts of your food choices or all your choices really just allows you to make decisions, okay? And figure out where maybe, hey, I may want to eat some imported cheese, but, you know, I also walk to work, so maybe that's not so bad, you know? And so again, information to make decisions. Okay, in-season food is an obvious one. Um, you know, if something is in season, it's likely to be um, grown less intensively, okay? Um, you know, it can be grown in a field under natural conditions rather than an intensive greenhouse or rather than brought from somewhere very far away. Um, you know, it, it just makes a lot of sense to eat in season food. Um, it's fresher and it tastes better um, are two other things. Some of the things that they do agriculturally to make um, food that's out of season um, tasty and, and provide it to you in the market at those times, you know, they, they, they're not so appetizing. And so um, in season food is the, really the best you can do. It lowers your um, carbon footprint and it's more delicious. Okay, um, and you know, talking about all these food decisions really reminded me, you know, if you think historically back in World War II was kind of the last time that I see this kind of attitude of people coming together, um, trying to work, work together to reduce our, our carbon footprint. You know, as, as a globe and as a country, um, we realize that there's this problem that we're all involved in. We're all contributing to the increase in carbon in the environment. And people are talking about coming together. What can we do? And I pulled up this old, this old post from World War II era, um, you know, grow a garden, it's thrifty and it's patriotic. And so um, some, some of the ideas that are floating around today about, you know, um, managing our, our carbon budget really kind of harkens back to World War II attitudes of people coming together. Um, and I think there may, be, there may be a day very soon where politicians are saying, you know, reduce your carbon footprint, it's patriotic. Okay. Um, the USDA also was a big part of this um, back around, you know, the wartime when resources were potentially scarce. Um, they actually gave out guidelines of how to deal with food, and the idea here was to reduce waste. Waste um, increases your carbon footprint when food um, arrives from the market to the table and is lost at the table, okay, or goes bad um, in the home. Um, that that's a waste of resources, and so the USDA back at this time had very specific guidelines for how not to waste food. Okay, they were to get coming, people coming together, working on this problem together. And what I see with talking about carbon is the same kind of thing. People are starting to talk about ways that we can strategize this. Okay, what else? So um, food choices, packaging is a big one. Okay, so this is kind of obvious. Does a single banana need to be shrink wrapped inside of a styrofoam tray? Not really, okay? And so when, so look around um, and you know, when you see um, ridiculous packaging, just don't buy those things. I mean, it's, it's really silly. Um, but there's a tremendous amount of, of cost going into packaging something like this that, that's quite simple. So, um, recycling is another one. It is a good idea to recycle, okay? Recycling, um, it, it can actually reduce the cost of producing future products, okay? And that's true recycling, but I'd like to just take a moment to distinguish between recycling and downcycling, okay? Because there's a lot of downcycling that's getting passed off as recycling. Recycling is when you take a glass bottle and you recycle it into a glass bottle. It is cycled, okay? A lot of what people are calling recycling now is actually downcycling. You take a bunch of stuff and you make this matter and you make something, but that thing can never be recycled. Okay, it's stuck there. It's been downcycled to something else. So keep in mind, when people are talking about recycling, always stop and think, is this recycling or is it downcycling? And if it's recycling, good. If it's downcycling, challenge them. Because recycling matter into something that can never be recycled again is not really recycling. Okay, so keep that distinction in mind. Okay. Recreation is another thing that affects your carbon footprint, right? If you are out water skiing um, with a motor-driven vehicle, um, you're burning much more carbon than if you're, say, out hiking to the top of a mountain where you're burning your own energy to hike up that mountain, right? And so, um, you know, how you recreate, what you do for fun, 
has a big impact on your carbon footprint, okay? Now, realistically, you know, we're not all just going to stay at home for the rest of our lives because we want to lower our carbon footprint. Um, we're going to go out and recreate. We need to blow off steam. Um, we need to relax so that we can be creative. And whatever you do for recreation, you know, keep, keep these things in mind. Um, if you're going on a European vacation and jetting off to Europe to eat a lot of fancy cheese, then obviously you're going to have a bigger carbon footprint than if you decide to hike the Grand Canyon for your summer vacation, okay? Um, so again, you know, these are all, all choices. And the, the idea here to emphasize is to kind of be aware of where different choices affect your carbon footprint so that you can make informed decisions, okay? Maybe this year you want to go on a hike for summer vacation, and in a couple of years you're going to save up for that, that big carbon intensive vacation, okay? So it really depends. You can make decisions and moderate your own carbon footprint. Okay, financial services are another one. Um, I know most of you aren't very involved in this, but this was interesting because I thought to myself, and looking down the list of carbon footprint specifications, what is it about financial services that cause a high carbon footprint? And I actually looked this up, it didn't make sense to me at first. The first is, um, the, these banks, they're always in really tall buildings downtown that have windows that can't open, so they're air conditioned or heated constantly, okay? Um, even if the weather's perfectly fine outside, they can't open a window and turn off the air conditioning. They're really intensive buildings. These structures are, are very energy intensive. Okay. The other thing is with a lot of financial services, sometimes with these you know, diverse pro portfolios you put into a mixed fund, you don't really know where your money's going. I mean, your money could be you know, invested in some gigantic coal factory in Africa that's you know burning coal very inefficiently and creating a tremendous amount of carbon in the atmosphere and you could be investing in that without knowing and so with financial services um, you know questioning them understanding where your money's going um, and also you know as time goes on don't don't stop questioning why they spend so much money um, to run these big buildings and why they're always downtown and why everything in their work has to be first class because we're paying for that Okay, so what the picture that starts to emerge here is if we look at a typical person's carbon footprint, um, there are all these different components that go into it. And th this is actually um, from New York City. New York City has been really, really progressive and advanced in terms of calculating carbon budgets because they're the most dense city in the US, one of the most dense in the world. They have a lot of people living in a very small area um, and they're all using electricity, they're all using resources together. So New York is very, very aware of the resources that people in their city use. And um, you know, looking at some of their data, what they've come up with are, you know, how much people use, um, you know, what makes up your carbon footprint? Well, you know, some holiday flights, some food and drinks, some recreation and leisure. The one thing in here that really, really struck me that I did not anticipate was um, the carbon used in manufacturing a car. And so it's a huge uh, carbon cost to manufacture a car. Um, so basically, you know, the, the gas and oil you might use to drive around in a year, maybe 15% of your carbon budget, but the carbon in the car that was manufactured for you would be 7%. And that's per year. So that's, you know, you buy a car over the next years, you have that car, it's about 7% per year. So tremendous amount of energy in manufacturing cars. I know, I didn't, I didn't realize that. That was somewhat of a surprise to me. Okay, so what have we learned? Um, one of the things that, that has come out of here is, as I've worked with plants, I've learned that there, there are always trade-offs, okay? So if a plant is gonna open its stomata to gain carbon from the atmosphere, it's also gonna be losing water, okay? And if a plant's in kind of a dry area, that, that, could, that loss of water could be a heavy cost, okay? But it's a necessary cost. They have to open their pores to gain carbon to grow and they're gonna lose water. So it's kind of trade-offs. And I started thinking about us in terms of the way we trade off resources to gain things like energy. And so one of them um, is water for energy. So I don't know if anyone's heard about this in the Mojave Desert close to here. Um, they're actually building a lot of solar panels to take advantage of that bright sun in the desert and to provide energy um, in, in a way that doesn't affect our atmosphere. The interesting thing is that they're also going to be pumping water from deep down in the desert soils um, to use as a heat transfer fluid for these um, solar panels. So in this case, you know, we, we live in California, we know it's a semi-arid environment. We know that we get a lot of our water from the Colorado River. And so those aquifers in the desert, that, that's valuable water. So in this situation, we're going to be trading some water to get energy from these solar panels, okay? So it's not, 
it's not just that we're getting this bonus energy, there is a cost for us in terms of another resource. And thinking about how resources can be coupled is really interesting because it's not just about carbon. Our carbon cycles are also coupled to our water cycles and our food cycles, okay? Um, we use energy for water, right? So the California aqueduct comes down the Central Valley and then if you've ever, you know, if you ever come from the Bay Area and you start getting to the grapevine and you look over to the right, you're gonna see this. They're pumping the water from the aqueduct up over the grapevine into Los Angeles. You think this uses some energy? Yeah, okay. So in this case, we're using energy to get water for us. In other cases, we're using water to get energy for us. These cycles are coupled, okay, much like they are in plants. Um, well, obviously, we also use energy for food. We're driving a tractor around, burning fossil fuels to drive this tractor around the field um, to grow our, our food, okay? And this is okay as long as we have fossil fuels. Uh, fossil fuels are very cheap. For each barrel of energy we expend to get um, fossil fuels, we get about 50 equivalent of barrels of energy, okay? Because all we have to do is take it out of the ground and burn it, basically, okay? If you're talking about other forms of energy like wind or solar, for, for every unit of energy you put in, you only get about 10 or 15 back. You know, so as this fossil fuel energy, which is it's kind of ghost energy because it's come from a long time ago and we're expending it, as this ghost energy is depleted, um, we're gonna have to think carefully about agriculture and um, especially energy intensive agriculture. Okay, the, the factories with the smokestacks making fertilizer, the factories with the smokestacks making pesticides, the tractors driving around with fossil fuels. Okay, okay, so, at this point, you should have a pretty good view of what goes into your carbon footprint. The question becomes, what can we do, okay? So, not all of us are going to go out and buy a Nissan Leaf, okay? Which would be a pretty good thing to do for your carbon footprint, but, you know, they're expensive. Um, you may be 14 and not buying a car. Many of us are not gonna go out and buy a Nissan Leaf, right? So what can we do? What can normal people do um, in terms of our carbon footprint? Okay, one of the most interesting and exciting things about all this is the potential for new careers. Um, as energy becomes limiting, businesses and governments are desperately looking for ways to, new ways to produce energy. And um, the wind turbines that are springing up all over the place are a very effective way. And I thought of this because there's actually this new TV show on the Weather Channel called Turbine Cowboys. And it's about these like big, burly men and women who are rappelling down these giant turbines and they're, they're climbing up them in like harsh weather to work on them so that people can get electricity. And it's, it's totally heroic. It's really cool. You should check it out. But the, the point here is that, you know, for, for those of you that are going to be entering into professions um, in the coming years, the energy fields are changing and there's likely to be a, a, an incredible variety of new career choices where many of you as professionals may actually be directly working on new forms of energy and be spending your lives um, try, trying to find innovative ways um, to keep us energized. And so I think that's really exciting, especially for young people. Okay, another thing you can do um, is hold on to your car. I know that many of you um, are not driving yet, but if you were and you hold on to your car for a very long time, um, every year that you hold on to it, you are having a major impact on, on your carbon footprint because of the cost of manufacturing a car. So, you know, um, and th you know, this works for a car, this works for just about anything, your stereo system, you know, if you're the kind of person who has to have that new stereo system all the time when something new comes out, you want that new one and you're getting rid of the old one, you know, there's a carbon cost there, okay? On the other end of the spectrum, if you only buy your stereo equipment at thrift shops, you know, there's essentially no carbon cost there. Someone else, when they bought it, paid for that carbon cost for you. Um, so second-handed items have a big impact there um, with, you know, holding onto your, your car or anything else. Um, the same is true, okay? Um, it's similar for fashion, okay? Um, people who always have to have the latest fashions, you know, maybe you've just gotta have that Pac-Man dress that was on the runway in New York, you know, turning over clothes more often, always having the new trends, well, you're gonna have uh, an impact on, on your carbon footprint. On the other end of the spectrum, if you always buy your clothes at thrift shops, you know, there's not much of a carbon footprint there. I know that the, the thrift shop style has gone in and out of fashion. I'm not sure where it is now, um, but you know, that can be quite a, a, quite a good way to improve your carbon footprint.
Okay, certifications are something to look for. Um, in all kinds of products, you're going to be seeing these in the next few years. Um, people saying our product is certified um, carbon neutral, which means either we have very good business practices or we're investing in some forest growth somewhere else that's bringing in a certain amount of carbon that offsets the carbon for our business, that kind of thing. Um, and most of these are very good, actually. The I've been really impressed with how they've done these certifications. I know the one for wood, for sustainable wood, if you buy wood that's certified sustainable, um, it is grown in, in forestry conditions that are really sustainable. And so um, some of these certifications are quite good. Look for those. Okay, vampire voltage is another one. Um, I know you've probably heard about this. You know, when, you, when, you've, when you're done charging your phone, you unhook your phone, it's still plugged in, it's using some electricity. Okay, so all, all of those things um, that are plugged in, all those chargers, those kinds of things, use electricity. Um, your entertainment center, right? You may only you know, listen to music or watch TV for a couple hours in the evening, but you know, the DVD box and all this stuff is all on all the time, right? And so you know, some people have dealt with this by getting power strips where they can just turn the whole thing off. Um, you know, we, we do this for our, um, our office where our computers and printers are, everything, we just turn the whole thing off. Um, and it's interesting, some, some of these uh, DVD boxes, they're, they actually don't work that well if you turn them on and off because they need time to kind of establish when all the programs are and you can lose programming. So there are actually people working with the cable companies now to try to develop um, DVD boxes and, and consoles that can be turned on and off. So they don't need to be on 24 hours a day if you're only going to watch TV for a few hours a day. So, you know, just cognizantly looking around your house and seeing, you know, where are things plugged in that are not being used that can be turned off or turned off with a power switch um, is really effective. Okay, another one is get together. You know, when people come together and they dine together, um, there is less of, of a carbon cost. You know, if everyone's cooking on their own little stove, they're using a lot of energy, but when people come together and cook together, um, it's not that much more energy to cook more food. And so um, dining together and being social um, actually lowers your carbon footprint. And so, you know, a lot of these things, I mean, I, I, the way I think of it is, is like, why wouldn't you live with a lower carbon footprint? It's healthier, it's cheaper, and it's more fun, you know? So, so why, why wouldn't you do it? Get together, hang out. Government advocacy is another one. Um, you know, our government makes decisions, and they make decisions about about our, our carbon footprint as a nation, okay? Whether to sign on to Kyoto, okay? So the world came up with this treaty, many people signed on to it and agreed that they would comply with those rules. Our country did not, and so why didn't they? Um, people in this country didn't voice a strong opinion that they wanted them to. And so, and maybe some, maybe some people voiced a strong opinion that they didn't want them to. Okay, and so all of us have a voice, and Washington responds. Okay, they're always looking for feedback from people. Call your congressman or go to the National Registry. Uh, I learned about this when I was in Washington last summer. The National Registry is a place where um, our government they put up documents for people to review, and um, people you can just type in comments online, you know, and say what you think about that document. And the, this is before they become bills or laws. So this is very early on. If you look in the National Registry, you'll find out what people are talking about, you can get your voice in there um, before it goes to higher levels and have more of an impact. So that's very important. Okay, appliances. There are four appliances in your house that use much more energy than any other appliance. They're the microwave, the water heater, the dishwasher, and the dryer. Okay, so I mean, it's really stark. Like, they're, they're, those four use a ton of energy, and everything else doesn't use that much. So in terms of appliances in your house for your carbon footprint, focus on these four. Okay, watch how much you use them. Okay, think about when you need to use them, when you don't need to use them. If it's, you know, 95 degrees outside with a dry Santa Ana wind blowing through, you could probably hang your clothes and they would dry. Okay, so think about these things. Okay, um, and the point here that I'm trying to make is to provide options for people, you know. Obviously, if we manage our, our carbon footprints and cause less CO2 to go into the atmosphere, that's good for everyone, okay? But these are personal choices. These are your own choices and your own relationship with the atmosphere. And understanding the impacts of your different activities really go a long way for you to make decisions about um, how much carbon you want to expend, okay? So, and you know, I when I give this talk, you know, I'm, I'm not, 
condemning anyone for your actions or what you do. I just want to provide people with options. And think of it this way, okay? Maybe if you are a person who really likes to drive your SUV that gets terrible gas mileage, you know, and you feel like, wow, I'm really not doing a service to the atmosphere because this car is such a polluter, maybe you put solar panels on your roof, you know? And so, okay, I like to drive my horrible car, but I have solar panels on my roof. My overall carbon budget may be much less than someone who drives a Prius, okay? And so you have to think about this holistically. Where, where do you want to kind of save up your, your carbon impacts and have some fun for some things? And where are, what are ways that you can every day in your life um, you know, have a lower carbon impact. And remember, as I emphasize, it's more fun, it's cheaper, and it's healthier to have a low carbon footprint. So you're, you now have a lot of information to make your own decisions for this. Thank you very much. Why is carbon bad? Carbon is not necessarily bad, um, but there's too much of it in the atmosphere. Um, in, in the atmosphere in high concentrations, it holds in heat and can have an effect on our temperatures. Um, greenhouse effect is what it's called. So carbon in and of itself isn't bad, but too much of it in one place can affect our climate. What is your carbon footprint? Good question. So um, I went through the exercise uh, with the carbon footprint calculator and calculated it out. And actually, it's pretty close to the, the national average, the per capita average. And the reason is, um, although I, I live really close to UCR and I, I bike and walk to work a lot, um, it's, the, it's the plane fares flying at least once a year. Um, it just really brings up my carbon footprint to right around the average. And what is the person's downfall for their big carbon footprint? Well, you know, if everyone has a really big carbon footprint, we're gonna change the atmosphere tremendously. And so um, it's, it's not going to be that healthy for us to live on this planet if um, we're trapping in a lot of heat. Um, as a person, you know, as an individual, um, it's important to think about that. You have an, a relationship with the, in, with the environment, with the atmosphere. Um, and a high carbon footprint lifestyle, it's gonna affect the atmosphere. Um, and it may also affect your health. Um, if you're eating highly processed foods um, or spending too much time in a car or those kinds of things. And so, as I mentioned, I, I think a low carbon footprint lifestyle is, is healthier. Okay, so I understand that a lot of carbon is bad, but wouldn't it be also bad if we didn't have enough? That's right. Yeah, we, we need carbon um, in a variety of parts of our life. Um, a lot of foods we eat are carbon. Okay, and so, um, so we definitely need it as part of our life as it cycles around. Um, it's just in, in the atmosphere, having too much of it there traps in heat. Um, we, if we had too low of a carbon concentration in the atmosphere, then it would make it very difficult for plants to grow and it would ultimately affect our food sources. So, so you're right, um, where, where we are now is getting a little bit high, but if it were to be too low, then it would cause other problems. And so it really is kind of keeping it in, in a good spot in the middle. Yeah, so like if we planted a tree for every person, like would that bring it in the middle or would it like make it too low? If we planted a tree for every person, it would start to bring it down. Um, the thing is that um, our atmosphere, the way, the way it works, there's a little bit of a time lag. So it's kind of on a trajectory for increasing carbon. If we were to drastically change our activities um, and start planting trees and reduce our carbon outputs, it would be a few years before the CO2 concentration would go down. It would actually keep going up for a couple years because there's a little bit of a time lag. But um, yeah, if we planted a tree for every person, it would probably bring it closer to the middle, maybe not all the way. Um, could something be invented that could like absorb carbon like trees? Yeah, people have actually talked about this. They've talked about um, some environmental um, scrubber, like an atmospheric scrubber, it'd be a machine that would absorb carbon and take it out of the atmosphere. The problem with these things is that they, they to run them, they use energy, and so at some point you're expending some energy and you're getting rid of some carbon in the atmosphere. Um, it's not a big impact. Another thing people have talked about is um, taking, growing very, trees until they're very large and then 
putting them at the bottom of the ocean where, um, where they won't decompose, so their carbon won't go back in the atmosphere. It'll effectively be locked inside of that tree inside the bottom of the ocean. And then they plant a new tree that'd be sequestering carbon. They do the same thing. So people have talked about some of these kinds of things. Um, you know, th there's even one person from um, Siberia who, who said what we should actually do is cut down most of the world's forest and build big pieces of thick wood furniture. Um, that would that would never um, be burned or never go, end up back in the atmosphere. We'd use that furniture, and then we'd let all the forest of the world grow back, and that huge pulse of forest growth would take a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere at once. So people have thrown around some big ideas, um, you know. But of course, given that all these forests are in different countries and owned by different people, you know, we're talking about global activities. Everyone would kind of have to agree to these things in order to do them. So that's some of what has stalled them out. But. I think people are being very creative and coming up with lots of different ideas. And I, I think um, there's still a lot of time to be creative. Any ideas that people have, it's time to throw those out there um, because the limit is our own creativity at this point. If everyone grew a garden, would the carbon level decrease? Yes, yes, people's carbon footprints would decrease if everyone grew a garden. Because if you think about it, you could, at least for some foods, you'd be able to go into your backyard or, or go to your community garden and just be able to pick what you want and bring it right home um, instead of you know tractors planting it out in the field, um, it being brought to, to the store in a truck, it being refrigerated in the store. Um, you would basically cut out all that activity and you would get food direct from the garden to your table. And so um, because of those other um, industrial activities that you cut out, yeah, the carbon footprint of that particular food would be less. So how exactly does carbon trap heat? Ah, yeah. Um, the individual CO2 molecules in the atmosphere, um, when they receive a, a photon of energy from the sun, um, they can actually hold it in. And with a lot of those, they have a big impact um, across the atmosphere of holding that heat in. So it really is a, a molecule per molecule um, heat trapping capacity. So um, you were talking about the electric cars and hybrid cars. Which of the which of them that are like out on the market, like the Tesla, the Leaf, stuff like that? Which one do you think is like the best? Hmm, good question. So um, I I'm kind of really interested in the Leaf because it's pure electric. And has anyone seen the movie Who Killed the Electric Car? It's, it's, a, it's a great movie, rent, rent, rent it on Netflix, um, because they actually, it, around the year 2000, they actually brought electric cars to Los Angeles, and I mean, mostly only movie stars got them and got to drive them around, and they, they were fantastic. People love them, you know, and so the Leaf is that. It's a pure electric car. Um, I, it should be, should be fantastic. I've never driven one. Um, but, you know, the Prius also is very good, and the Prius, although it does use some gas, and its um, gas mileage is about 44 miles to the gallon, which isn't much beyond some really efficient normal cars, the emissions are really good. So even though it is, is using gas, if you look at what comes out of the tailpipe, there's a lot less pollutants. And so all, all of the Chevy Volt also is, is, is very good. It can go all electric or, or both. Um, you know, they, they vary to some degree in terms of their emissions and efficiency, but they all are steps very much in the right direction. Um, but I, I, I look to the LEAF in the future. We just need more charging stations and we can be zipping around with clean energy all the time.